Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of Bible Questions and Answers. On my uh, left, I have uh, Mama Jean, and I have Joe, who's going to be answering questions that were sent in to us. So we're going to start off with our first question of the day. The first question is, how do we know the Bible is the true Word of God? Who wants to take that? Mama Jean? I'll start it because you were lied to it. Hi, my name is Mama Jean, or you can call me Jean. Um, I've been studying the Word of God for many, many, many years. And so, uh, we have a, a, a show called Let's Talk Bible. And from that, there was a lot of people that got some questions that they wanted to have answered. So we uh, put them together, and we're going to do our best. Some of them are outside of Bible, but we're going to take them as they come and just do the best we can. So the first question was, how do we know that the Bible is the true Word of God? Well, that's not easy to say, because people are coming from all different directions. First of all, um, we have people that just believe in God and believe in the Bible, and so we're on an equal footing because then we can go in the Word and ask the questions from the Word. But if someone is outside of the Bible and don't, doesn't even know whether or not they believe that there is a God, now we have to talk a little different. So how do we know? First of all, um, there's some magnificent, magnificent uh, verses in the chapter that show that God predicts things from the beginning to the end. But I want to say one thing, that without faith it's impossible to please God. So you're either going to fall in the camp of evolution or Bible. And I think it's a big leap of faith to believe in evolution. So I'm going to turn this over to Joey, and then we'll fine-tune it as we go. Sure. you have some insight on that? Well, I'll just add my two cents worth. First of all, I want to say... These questions are questions that um, we just ask people at random uh, in everyday everyday life, and they're not pre. -re we don't have pre-rehearsed answers, so just want to make everyone aware of that. What I'll uh, how I'll answer this question is, you know, this question can be posed by someone who's not a Bible believer, who's not presently a Bible believer, who may not even believe in God. So my take is, I'm not going to turn to the pages of the Bible to try to prove the Bible to someone. So for me, I'll just say this. From my youth, I've always believed that there was a, a creator. I don't, I, I've never envisioned life coming from something that, some non-existent life. It doesn't make any sense to me logically, never has since I was right. a youth. When they talk about the theory of evolution and all that, well, where did life come from in the first place? So that just, I've never had, I've never considered life without a creator. It just doesn't make any logical sense to me. But the Bible now, um, so, for me, there being a creator, in my mindset, just like if we buy a car or a washing machine or anything else, it comes with a manual on how to use the thing properly. Well, I believe that there's a creator who gave us a manual on how to live properly that will bring, bring health and peace and harmony amongst people. The Bible is a book, unlike any other that I know of. It was written over the course of uh, slightly over 1,500 years by 40 different authors. Now, this... This cannot be debated. This cannot be debated. It wasn't like some guy just sat down um, 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago and penned the whole Bible and, and made it seem as if it was written over the course of 1,500 years. No, it was written over the course of 1,500 years. Mankind has found uh, text of Scripture, manuscripts, and different fragments of Scripture over the course of all of these centuries. And archaeology backs it up. So to have a book that's written over the course of 1,500 years, the whole, now the question of canonization of the Bible, how did all of these various books, the 66 books that we have in our uh, Old Testament, New Testament canon, how did they get canonized? How did they come together? It's a whole different question. I'm not going to touch on that. But the way that these books um, were written over this course of time, and they're all very, very uniquely congruous, and it just makes a common thread that runs from Genesis to Revelation in my eyes. So for me, I have no problem believing the Bible. Proving it to somebody else is a whole different story. But I would say this, and I would challenge anyone, 
Um, certainly, if you don't believe in God and don't believe the Bible, it's a hard challenge for you. Right. But the Bible is a living book. And to understand it better, we have to live it and put it into practice and apply it in our lives. Applying the principles of the Bible makes it come alive more to me. I'll just say that from personal experience. Right. Mars, okay. do you want to say anything to that? Would you like to I'm add to I'm going to read the second question. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, for the second question, there's two parts to it. Why does God allow suffering? That's the first part. I'll start it and then finish it. Basically, uh, that has been a big, big uh, problem for people to understand because we live in a fallen world. Of course, if you believe the Bible, then you have it stop. You know the story of Adam and Eve. You know that uh, there was sin that came and there was disobedience and there was a curse uh, on the world at that time and there is a plan of redemption. So you have a situation where we have a fallen world, we have an enemy, we have enemies, uh, we have a spirit world going on. You've got two-thirds of the angels that are on God's side, and one-third are on this uh, side of Satan that we know as Satan or the adversary. Uh, how we can put this all together, because basically in Scripture, it says that Satan is the God, small g, of this world. So a lot of the terrible things that are happening is because the world has gone to human nature and it goes down the road of a sinful way, which causes consequences. The whole world is groaning. It's just filled with suffering and sorrow, and God has a plan to wipe that all out when his kingdom returns. So he has not abandoned his people. He's been with them all along, but right now we are going the way of Satan. The world is going that way, and we will be turning to God in the kingdom and the millennium. Basically, that's the cause. Sin is the cause of all the suffering that we see most of the time. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Mom. Well, I want to go to the second part. Two. Uh, why does God allow evil? Yeah, um, I, I echo the comments of Mama Jean here that there is, in fact, a, um, a devil, what we know as the devil, who Satan is a Hebrew word, Satan means adversary. He, is the, he became the adversary of God, and then God created human beings on the earth, and he has a plan for human beings. However, he didn't create human beings as robotic creatures. He created human beings with free moral agency, and we have to choose. Adam and Eve were given a choice in the garden. This, serpent came along in the garden and deceived the woman and and then the woman um, talked to her husband and, and, and he sinned. So both the, the woman and the man sinned. And there's a penalty to pay for sin. <clears throat> the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and that's why we die. Also curses were meted out as you said Mama Jean. There was a curse on the, on the serpent, there was a curse on the woman, there was a curse on the man. Uh, many folks have difficulty reconciling the concept of an all-loving, all-powerful God, and yet there being sin and evil and pain and suffering in this world. In other words, if God's all-powerful, why does he allow it? Well, he allows it according to the Bible because he has a plan. And once again, uh, I'll say this, that most Bible-believing Christians, and I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but... From my perspective, most Bible-believing Christians believe this is the only day of salvation and that God is in a contest with the devil and that God's trying to save everybody right now and the devil's trying to deceive everybody and lead them all astray. And if that is the case, if that's true, then let's face it, when, when all the chips are down and counted, who's winning that battle? And it's quite obvious that God is not winning that battle if that's what's going on. But the truth of the matter is the Bible teaches that this is not the only day of salvation and that God is working out a plan in his time to reconcile all of humanity to him. Now I can belabor this and get into a whole bunch of Bible verses to make my case and make the point from the scriptures, but that in my opinion, Morris, is why there's pain, suffering, and evil. Um, and the, sec the second part of your question was what? Why is there evil? Right. Yeah, that's how I see that. Okay. 
question number three. <clears throat> how do me how do mediums know personal information about loved ones? Okay, for those that don't know even what mediums are, I'm going to clarify it a little bit. There's a lot going on. Uh, you you've probably been you've seen it. It's in, it's in TV. It's you talk among yourself and everything. There's a lot of witchcraft going around. There's a lot of um, uh, divination and sorcery and um, all kinds of astrology. Uh, there's all kinds of different things that replace God. And the people are very innocent when they think, they think that they're dealing with um, just omens and maybe they're getting uh, a special, special message from a dead person and that that dead person is telling you uh, what they want you to do or how they're with you in spirit, whatever. But I'm here to tell you that the Bible doesn't teach that. I can go to verse and we can go there if we have to. But basically, God condemns all that kind of behavior and consulting the dead, he's very much against that. He tells us not to do that. We have many scriptures that can prove that. And the reason why is that these are evil spirits that are impersonating themselves as uh, dead people and they're tricking the people and that's all emotion. They're, they're saying, you know, through this seance and whatever other things that, are, even the Ouija board is really uh, a form of uh, divination. It's all bad, God condemns it. The reason why he's trying to protect us from the evil spirits in the evil world, you're getting in contact with that. Not your loved one, and certainly not God. How do fortune tellers uh, know the future and well, they'll tell people different things that are going to happen to them? Because, basically, you have a spirit world going on. There is a fight, uh, there is a, two spirit worlds, the evil and the good. And so the spirits know what's going on. They, they, they have an inside um, a view of what happened in the past. They've been around here for many, many years, thousands and thousands, right? Or even more. Uh, so I, I think you could speak to that better, Joe. But basically, they know the past. They know what's going on now. And uh, so they, they can tell little tidbits to, t you know, to uh, take... Uh, Wet your appetite on certain things. You say, "Oh, that's true." So it's believable. But that path is a slippery slope, and the further you, the further you go with that, the more you go against God. Or move okay. along. Or yes. Go yeah. to four. This is quite interesting. Four. Four is who is in heaven, and how do we get there? Who is in heaven? According to the Bible. There's, there's one that people know of as God, the Father, sitting on a throne in heaven. Presently, again, according to the New Testament, the one that people know of as Jesus Christ, who I choose to call Yeshua, is at his Father's right hand. There are two beings in heaven. There are 24 elders seated on thrones around the throne of the Father, according to the book of Revelation and other places in the Bible. There are four living creatures at the throne of the Father, and there are thousands upon thousands, in fact, 10,000 times 10,000 holy angels in heaven, according to the Bible. Um, the book of Hebrews, to be, to be clear, does speak of the spirits of just men made perfect, apparently uh, in heaven, the spirits of just men made perfect, just that the Bible says that when we die, it says that the spirit returns to God who gave it. Not a soul, not a conscious being, but the spirit component in man returns to God who gave it. So that is, to answer the question, Mo, that is who the Bible, as I see it, tells us is in heaven. I think the question is alluding to, though, what people are in heaven. And if that's what the question means, I don't believe the Bible teaches any people are in heaven. The Bible teaches that the dead know not anything. The dead is, being dead is a total polar opposite from being alive. That means we're dead. That means there is no life. 
We don't have an immortal soul according to the Bible. So when we die, there's no conscious part of us that drifts off either to heaven, this great place, this utopian place, nor hell, this place of, tor of eternal torment and burning forever. The Bible just does not speak of that. Even though most Christian folks will tell you the Bible does say that. But it does not say that. It does not say that. Um, so, as far as people being in heaven, there are no people in heaven. In fact, Jesus Christ said, no man, when he was here on the earth 2,000 years ago, no man has ascended to heaven except he who came down from heaven, speaking about himself. So at least, John 3.13, as Mama Jean just said, so at least until 2,000 years ago, according to Christ, the one that Christian folks worship, no his words say, no man has ascended to heaven. I hope that answers that question. Uh, we have another part of it. Is there people in hell right now? Are there people in hell right now? I, contrary to what mainstream Christianity believes, that there is a uh, hell and that people are there burning forever and ever. Um, if you really study the Bible, you cannot find, you find that concept in uh, mythology. Uh, but when you look at the Bible, it has different names, Hebrew and Greek, for the grave. I think it's Hades and Shoel, Sheol. But basically, uh, it means the grave. Now, there are other instances where it talks about uh, a hell fire, and that's called the lake of fire, and that is going to happen right at the end of, uh, in Revelation, where the kingdom has been on earth for a thousand years, everyone that's ever lived has been resurrected, and then there is a lake of fire either in God's family or you're basically cremated, but as far as tormented forever and ever, I don't see that, Joe, what do you think? Well, I agree with you, Mama Jean. Um, the question, is anyone in hell, as Morris read it, I would say there's bodies in hell. There are bodies in hell because, as Mama Jean said, in the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are typically four words. Um, one Hebrew word in the Old Testament, Sheol, as Mama Jean said, which is the place of the dead. It's where dead people go. It's where bodies go. Um, and in the Greek New Testament, there are three Greek words that translate into English as hell in most English Bible translations. One, one is Hades. Hades is, again, the equivalent of the Hebrew word Sheol. It's where people go when we're entombed in the, in, the, in the ground. We go to hell, so to speak. But there's no consciousness there again. It's a dead body being put in the grave. That's hell. So, yeah, there were bodies in hell. Um, another Greek word only appears one time in the Greek New Testament is Tataru, which is a place of of um, restraint where God placed the angels that sinned in 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. And then the other one, as Mama Jean said, is the Greek word Gehenna. Gehenna. Gehenna is actually a transliterated Greek word from a Hebrew uh, phrase. And the Hebrew phrase is Gehenom. Gehenom in Hebrew is the Valley of Hinnom, which was a place on the south side of Jerusalem, the south side of the, the old city of Jerusalem, the, the city of David, where it was actually a dump. It was a garbage dump where all the refuse and the, the trash uh, in Jerusalem was burned. And so Gehenna is a Greek transliterated word from that Hebrew term. And it does mean there is fire equated with it because there is fire at that, at, that, at that particular area of Jerusalem burning the, the refuse and the trash. But as Mama Jean said, at the end of time, the Bible speaks of people being cast into this Gehenna in the Greek New Testament. But it makes it plain that they're not going to burn forever. They're not even there yet. So to answer the question again, folks aren't burning in this hell yet. It's going to happen when Christ returns and he separates people as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And the ones that the Bible considers goats, for instance, in Matthew chapter 25, will be cast into the fire to this Gehenna fire? So the answer is no. 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 All right. Okay. Question five. Can someone have a relationship with God if they do not attend church? 
Okay, I, I think we need the definition of church. And, and I think Joe's got a good uh, concept of that. Basically, the word church means ecclesia, or those people that are called out. It's not the building, it's the people. And so, there are many people that worship, can worship God in spirit and tr truth and not go to a church, a church building or a religion that would not be something that would line up with scripture. However, um, we're told to assemble. And we do help one another. But yes, I do believe, uh, maybe uh, I'm wrong, but I do believe that you can have a relationship with God and not go to church. Because sometimes church has become very confusing because there's all different doctrines that are going on. And so the, the other question is, where is the true church? So I'm going to turn that over to Jim. Yeah, I'll just add, uh, my, my answer to that is very simple is yes. A person can't have a relationship yes. with God without going to church. Because church, as Mama Jean said, is not a place to go. It's not a building. We don't go to church. We use that term. I'm, what, are you, what are you doing Sunday morning? What are you doing on Sabbath? I'm going to church. We don't go to church. We are the church, as Mama Jean said. Church is a Greek word, ekklesia, which means a group of called out ones. Um, and the Hebrew equivalent would be kahal, the assembly of Israel in, in Acts chapter 7, verse 37, for instance, is called the church in the wilderness, when Israel was wandering for 40 years in the wilderness, long before any church, uh, the word church ever came on the scene, but it was the kahal, the, the called out believers of the assembly of Israel at that time. So, what if someone lives, um, lives in a remote part of the world, and there are no other believers around, so to speak, and they're all by themselves. Can God work with them? Of course. If we say not, we're limiting the Almighty One, the Creator. Um, he can call one into covenant relationship with Him, and certainly they are part of the church, if you will, but because the church is a spiritual organism, not a physical place to go. So, yeah, the answer to this, by all means, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Six. If there is only one God, how come there are so many different religions? Well, there is only one true God, and he tells us in his first commandment of the Ten Commandments that he will has no other God before him. So there are other gods, small g. Um, it does state in scripture that basically what the nations or what these religions worship, they worship to demons. So God doesn't want you involved with different religions. That sounds very, very bigoted, and it sounds like, you know, uh, you're not being fair, but there's only one true God and one true word of God. Everything else falls outside of that. It's false. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I'll just add uh, briefly that there's only one God, one true God, but there are many different religions because people pervert the concept of God. People pervert the Word of God, the Holy Bible. Uh, people come up with their own ideas. Christ, for those who worship Christ and who believe he's, he's worthy of worship and that he's the anointed one, Christ warned in Matthew 24, I'm just going to read his quote, Matthew 24, one of his quotes, verse 4, it says, Then Jesus replied to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. And so they'll point to Christ. I don't think that I don't think he means people are going to come along, although some do, and say that they're the Messiah. They'll point to Christ and say, yeah, Jesus, the one that was here 2,000 years ago, for those of us alive now, for instance, he was the Christ, but they will deceive many. How would they deceive many? By twisting the very message that he brought, for instance. He brought a message. He was a messenger sent from the Father to bring a message, the gospel. People teach their variation of what the gospel is. Christ brought a distinct message according to the Greek New Testament, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And very few teach that message, the coming kingdom of God. They teach their concept of, for instance, dying and going to heaven. If you're going to heaven... I'm going to ask, where's the kingdom? And if they say in heaven, remember, Christ taught his disciples to pray, for instance. What people know as the Our Father prayer in certain religions. 
Our Father who art in heaven, God's in heaven, holy is thy name, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here upon the earth as it is in heaven. Right so the kingdom message that Christ brought is a literal kingdom that's coming to this earth. So if we die and go to heaven, we're bypassing the kingdom. And so the answer, Mo, in my humble opinion, is that people pervert the message of even the Bible, not the least of which is then folks go off the rails and, and, well, in my opinion, I'll say they go off the rails and they just discount the Bible and they come up with their own religion. And so therefore there's umpteen religions and, and new ones sprouting up every day perhaps around the world. Good, that's very good. Okay, we have uh, another question here. Is why does God allow bad things happen to good people? Well, we have the same story of sin. Nobody wants to talk about sin. When you look at what's happening out in the world, they don't say, that's sin. They say, oh, they're looting and they're doing this and they're taking God's name in vain. They're not talking sin. Well, we get affected by other people's sin. And sometimes bad things happen to good people because bad people do things against good people sometimes. They'll shoot at random. They kill people. There's a lot of things that are going on. And the person gets affected. It's still the root cause of sin. Yeah, uh, bad things happen to good people. Sometimes the Father just allows us to be to go through trials and tests to refine us. You know, I think about like going to the dentist, for instance. Going to the dentist, you're going to go through some pain quite often when they're drilling yeah. into your teeth. Yeah. You know, thank God for Novocaine. But you know, it's uncomfortable. But in the end, they're doing something that's going to help you. You go to the doctor, same thing. Um, and the Bible also says time and chance happens to all. Um, I, I just want to mention, we do have an email, Mo. You, yeah. you want to give the email in case mm -hmm. folks have other questions, if they want to um, get in touch with us, or discuss things, or meet together for fellowship. Yes, we do have the email. The email is, is right here. It's Let's Talk Bible at Gmail. Yeah, let's Talk Bible at Gmail.com. Let's, so let's Talk Bible. Let's Talk Bible. R.I. I think it's. R I at gmail.com. So that would be Let's Talk Bible, R-I, at gmail.com. Okay. So if you have more questions, send them to us and we will answer them. We have a, another question here, which is, uh, do you, uh, well, you know what, we're going to hold this for the next segment. So uh, for today, this is all the questions that we're going to answer. But we hope to see you in uh, part two of our next segment. Have a good day, and God bless all of you.